Yeah, I am a big fan of Ron Pernick. Um, we met many years ago when clean tech was first getting off the ground, and he was responsible for one of the coolest events out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it was actually really exciting, completely focused on clean technology. Sometimes we get utilities in there, but, um, you know, I think we've definitely entered a new area, uh, era where utilities are woke. And um, it's been really exciting to be here for the last 24 hours and hear Africa or India or developing countries mentioned consistently. I certainly wasn't expecting that, but um, it's, it's a great lead up to what we're going to talk about today. So, um, is this my forward thing? Okay, great. Uh, nope. To the right. Okay, hold on. I have really nice pictures, so I really want to make sure this works. <laughs> Okay, technical difficulties. Um, but while we're waiting to get this resolved, um, just a little bit of background on me. Um, so I have actually spent over 20 years working in energy. And um, historically, um, I was an environmental activist. And when I moved to California, uh, I found out pretty quickly during the rolling blackouts that if I cared about the environment, one of the most important things I could do would get, was to get involved in the energy industry. So. Um, so I quickly became part of the Power for All campaign. I don't know if anybody here from California remembers that, but it was a behavior change campaign um, oops, uh, focused on uh, really trying to change the way we were using energy in a voluntary set of circumstances. And um, so since then, um, I, I got fairly involved in clean technology, but um, where I think I really built my chops was working inside the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, I was responsible for the statewide energy efficiency strategic plan, and, um, and in that process got very enamored with zero net energy. And um, I started then my own consulting practice and, and brought all that enthusiasm around ZNE and, and started working with some of these companies that are doing decentralized renewables in the developing world. And at that time, they had just started out and you know, they were almost apologetic for making money and creating sustainable businesses. Um, and their big objective was to kill kerosene. And I said, no, 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 this is about a whole new future of energy. And um, so that's really sort of how I got into um, this marketplace. And, and what's fascinating now is to see all of the lessons that not just the developed world can bring to developing, but vice versa. And that's what we'll talk about today. So uh, a little bit about uh, Power for All and uh, what we do. Um, so Power for All really is focused on energy, not as electrons, but as a great enabler for change. Um, all of us are quite used to having energy here, um, but you know, it was just over 100 years ago when many of us um, living in the United States didn't have anything to work with besides coal, kerosene, what, what most of the developing world has right now. So it's, it's really not about energy itself, but it's about what it can do for people, and it's about creating opportunity. Um, and, and one of the things that I think is important to remember is that a lot of the people living in villages um, in places like Uganda or Nigeria have to walk hours to charge their phones, um, have to regularly use poisonous, hazardous fuels to, to you know, power stoves or to, to power lamps. And what's, what, what got me, I think, so intensely interested in changing that equation is, is actually being in huts myself and seeing what it's like. Um, and then meeting some of the people and seeing all the potential um, in these individual lives that if they just had access to regular, safe, affordable energy, what that could do. And so that's really what we're focused on. It's about empowering people to enjoy the freedoms that come with access to regular energy, that chance to have a better education, to be able to study at night, and if you want, be able to relax and watch a football game at night. Um, so these are all important, but the, the hard fact is, is that there's still almost a billion people without any access to energy. Um, in this day and age, when we run businesses from cell phones, we have all the technology we need, so this is actually a complete injustice in my point of view. Um, beyond that, um, there's another billion people who have access to very irregular energy, and we'll talk a little bit about the reliab re reliability problems that are faced in Africa and India and, and parts of Southeast Asia. But the truth is, is that um, there, there is a better way, and that's really what we're trying to work on with this focus on advancing decentralized renewable energy solutions. 
Um, for so long, our development system has really focused on traditional ways of delivering energy, and that's traditional centralized grids. You know, and you guys know the numbers. I mean, it takes sometimes nine years to build and site a power plant, and, and even then, it's, it's just a fraction of the people who actually need the energy who get it. But with decentralized renewables, people are empowered when we have an affordable solution through things like PAYGO, um, paying for your energy as you go, literally. Uh, to, to own their own energy, control their own destinies. It's a real interesting approach to democratization of, of power. Um, one of the things we're inspired by, um, and you may have heard about the complete explosion of cell phones um, in, in parts of the world that don't have uh, telephone lines, is, is what this adoption curve looked like. And you know, in about the 2000s, when we first started seeing cell phones uh, pop up in Africa and other places um, that were still considered emerging markets, the adoption curve was quite slow. But then something happened. There was the advancement, not only of cheaper technology, so mass production led to um, lower cost of goods, but beyond that, um, it was a chance to see some competition and to be able to do bite-sized payments. So, um, you know, while we have these large monthly bills, what you can do in Africa is you go to a kiosk and you buy a scratch card and you buy just the amount of telephony that you need. And now what you can do is you can do the same thing with energy um, in places like India and Africa. And so because we have those same uh, competitive advantages as a sector, you know, low cost of goods, competition, and now the ability to pay with bite-sized chunks through our phones, we're seeing an incredible takeoff. And we think we can see the same hockey stick with the right enablers. And that's what our campaign is all about. Um, we focus on developing the energy access ecosystem. And uh, from, from our experience, there's not a single piece of this ecosystem that isn't critical to advancing a new future of energy. Um, CSOs play a really important point in terms of educating people how to use energy. It's, a, it's actually a very critical part of the equation. When you've never had energy before, you don't actually know how to use it. We saw the same thing here in the United States in the 1930s. When only 10% of the, co the country was electrified, we actually had people going around and doing road shows on how to, how to use electricity, how to use your appliances. So, um, so they play a very important role in this. Um, the companies themselves, incredibly important. Both international companies, some of the big names, uh, D-Light, Zola, used to be known as Off-Grid Electric, Green Light Planet, um, that have some serious venture capital behind them. Um, but then there's also a, a host of what we call last mile distributors, who are local companies, mom and pop shops that have gotten in this market too. I mean, talk about um, something I don't think anybody could have ever anticipated. Um, but getting the policy right is really critical. Um, in many cases, uh, the utility industries are regulated, but this new off-grid industry is not. Um, so it's really important to sort of band together and, and figure out what that needs to look like. Um, and media and shifting the narrative has been one of the most important things I think we've done um, to really transform the way people are perceiving this energy. Um, but you'll see at the top utilities, and um, having come from working in the utility sector myself, I knew that the ultimate golden chalice would be considered to be a serious form of energy in partnership with utilities, not a CSR program. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in terms of Utilities 2.0 and, and the effect that we're actually having in the world and how important you people in this room are to advancing that. Um, so let's talk about Utility 1.0 and how we got here. Um, first of all, how many people know what SDG 7 is? Okay, <laughs> I literally saw one hand go up, so let me tell you. Um, uh, there's a body called the United Nations, and um, they put together a group of goals, 17 of them in fact, that are all meant to be uh, achieved by 2030. SDG 7 is the commitment from the global system that everybody in the world will have access to clean, modern, reliable energy. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going so well. <laughs> um, you know, we're in this day and age where we're still relying on our usual approaches for the most part. We're, we're turning to centralized grid even though 85% of the people without energy aren't in a centralized situation. They're in very rural or peri-urban communities. Um, and so we keep investing in the same way, in the same old solutions that actually aren't solving the problem. 
Um, so, so what we need to do is figure out how do we get that 100 million people a year getting connections, um, which actually might even need to be more at this point because population can continues to grow as we continue to be slow on electrification. Um, but this is a really important topic, and again, it's something that those of us in the developed world ourselves can take for granted. Um, so, so beyond that, you know, that basic education, um, a little bit about why it doesn't work. The utility 1.0 system, what I mean by that is something that's traditionally a monopoly, something that's a vertical and integrated, not something that's been, um, you know, separated out, generation, transmission, et cetera. Um, and, and so the problems with that is that it relies on a model where there's only one type of energy and one amount of energy that can be delivered to any household through a wire. Um, and yet you see from these numbers here that the annual per capita consumption is 400 kilowatt hours in these developing markets. And some of these people aren't even using energy <laughs> um, versus 8,000 in OECD countries. So there's a big disparity about the kind of technology you can just see by that number that probably needs to be used to solve the problem. Uh, importantly, the connections in some countries, including Kenya, can cost up to $2,000 per household. Um, and that's something that most people don't even make in a year. So this system isn't really working. And, and you know, we've already talked about how new energy customers don't know how to use energy all the time. But again, we've got that geographic issues. And so you know, all utilities in the world, whether they're here or Africa, all have that sort of basic obligation of provision of service. And the structure that we've created by exporting this utility 1.0 system to these countries that, that really aren't built for it um, is that we're seeing a complete discrepancy in the amount of electrification. And um, it makes sense, right? So you've got dense populations, um, short distances, perfect place for a centralized system. But then when we're talking about billions of people who live in rural areas that need energy and, and deserve energy, because it is a right, it shouldn't be considered a privilege, um, there's just no way in this current structure for it, for it to happen. So the challenge as well is what it's like to actually run a utility or be a utility employee in developing countries. There's only two profitable ones in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they may, that might sound a little shocking, <laughs> and it, it's, it's challenging. Um, you know, in fact, the amount of money that's been talked about using business as usual approaches to electrify countries is somewhere north of $100 billion. $100 billion, but even with the math we've done, we've showed that using business as usual won't actually make that happen. The transmission and distribution losses are five to 10 times what we experience here. And most countries suffer over 500 hours of losses and outages per year. So how do you build a business? How do you grow your economy? How do you realize the potential of your people if, if that's your situation, if you can't count on your electrical supply? Um, and importantly, most of these, these companies are running huge, huge deficits. Um, they're loss making, they're loss leading, and the customers aren't engaged in a way that they can be educated and brought along that sort of energy ladder. So um, what I started to see, and, and I'm, I'm blessed with a wonderful uh, chief research officer, Rebecca Shirley, who was a postdoc under Dan Kamen, some of you might know, um, we were talking about how do we actually bring this whole discussion that's been going on in the States for all these years about integrated planning and the future of electricity, how do we bring a version of that to Africa, to India, to Malaysia that could actually make sense? And, and in that discussion, we realized what's happened is we're seeing that we've got this sort of um, almost partisan electricity system where people think it's either grid or off-grid and there's nothing in between. And we think it's black or white, whether people have energy, as opposed to tiers of access. And so we started conceptualizing how to actually take the idea of utilities, utilities specifically meant to be plural, utilities 2.0 forward. We started out with this chart, and it may seem very obvious to everyone in this room, but it's really interesting when you bring this to a room full of decentralized renewable companies um, and, and African utilities. And, and for the first time, they're seeing, oh yeah, we do have things that we could learn from each other and, and technologies that could benefit each other, ways of financing that would make a huge difference. You know, we've even seen a massive difference in the way that people handle their customers. Um, so, so this was really the sort of building blocks of how we've got this whole campaign started. But it's based on, on the just actual reality 
that neither grid utilities nor non-grid decentralized energy companies are purpose-built to solve energy poverty alone. We have to work together if we decide that this is a priority. So let me tell you a bit, uh, about how we're headed in that direction. So first of all, um, I was really blessed. One of our uh, great funders is the Rockefeller Foundation. And they have this amazing retreat center in Italy um, on Lake Como called Bellagio. And you have to really try hard to have a bad meeting there. <laughs> um, but uh, the brainchild was really to get together equal parts of centralized and decentralized parts of the energy sector, equal parts north and equal parts south, and yes, equal parts men and women. And the amazing thing that happened in these conversations was that everybody was really unified around this idea of utilities 2.0 and desperately wanted to come up with a definition that could guide what that future would look like. So what you see before you, it's admittedly a little wordy, um, but this concept, and we've heard these words over the last 24 hours here, it's really giving me great hope. Words like collaboration, um, communication, integration, interactivity, um, bi-directional, that's actually what Utilities 2.0 is. And that's what we're trying to create, but it's important to remember it's not just a technology topic. It's actually a cultural topic. So um, the way that we have decided to go forward and pursue this is to set out a clear vision. Um, and, and then beyond that, um, we've had different countries come to us wanting to pilot how we could do this in, in reality. So we were quite blessed. One of the two profitable utilities in Africa that I mentioned earlier, um, one of them came to us, um, and uh, it's Umeme in Uganda. And they are actually listed. They're an investable company. Um, and they are profitable, but at the same time they're profitable, only 25% of that population has energy access. I mean, it's a fascinating situation, right, for anybody who cares about energy. Beyond that, um, they, uh, they've just uh, completed a, a new uh, hydropower project. And in the same situation where they have a grid that already can't deliver the amount of energy with the consistency that people want or need, they are about to have 3x the amount of energy on their grid. So they are about to have an oversupply problem in this situation where 75% of the population doesn't have access. So they know they need to innovate. They know they need to change. Um, so, so after setting out that vision, um, you know, we found a bit of a coalition of the willing. At our, at our kickoff event at Bellagio, you know, we had all the big names. We had Enel, we had um, NG, we had several companies like that, and then we also had um, a, a number of um, decentralized companies, and my co-chair of the event actually was um, uh, Jim Rogers, who used to be the head of Duke Energy. Rest in peace, he died a year ago, was on my board. Um, but, you know, having that level of endorsement of this concept was really useful. And what we've come out with now is this incredible partnership where we're doing an integrated energy pilot. So what does that mean? It's, like I said, not just technology. It's a bunch of things. And if you see in that second column, the focus areas, these are all the things we're working on integrating. So it includes products. It includes profits, though. That's really important because none of this works if people can't make money and don't have sustainable businesses. Um, it also includes policy. So the same things we were just hearing about from, um, I guess, my spirit animal, Richard Kaufman, <laughs> is the importance of having policy that actually helps with integration. Um, we don't have anything. When, I, when he was mentioning something about sort of having a suite of policy solutions, we actually need that globally. And that's something that, that creating something that, that is replicable and understandable across these countries, which are all so different, Africa is not a monolith, would make a huge difference for these companies to scale. Um, and integrated planning, it's about humans at the end of the day. Sure, there's you know, 10 to 20 year planning cycles that we have here in the US. Those are all based on known connections, right? So it's not like there's a whole bunch of unexplicable demands, you don't know what to expect. This is it's a completely different ballgame in Africa. So, so all of this has created a very dynamic environment, and it's included everything from you know, having to shift the culture internally at Umeme, doing things like taking them on workshops where they learn about human-centric design and customer acquisition the way decentralized companies do it. They are deeply and intimately involved with their customers. They understand and adapt their products on a regular basis, and they have a whole range of energy access solutions, right? So when we're talking about in the UN system, you know, SDG 7, 
There's now a system known as um, the multi-tier framework where we talk about different levels of energy access because customers can't go from zero to 1,000 kilowatt hours a year like that. It just can't happen. Um, and that's what's, what we are trying to solve is how, do you, how are you in partnership with your customer and teaching them to use energy, making it affordable, applying the right incentives um, to get the actual level of energy use we want and that people deserve. So what does this look like as a pilot? So we have four sites that we're working in in Uganda. Um, there's two completely unelectrified sites. Everything's within about a kilometer of the Umeme grid. But then we have two sites that are on grid because as I mentioned, you know, part of this challenge is what are the decentralized solutions that can help the centralized side? And um, what we're seeing is, you know, Umeme or the Rural Electrification Agency will have actually strung a wire through a community and nobody's connected to it. Or maybe 50% of the population is connected to it, even with a free connections policy. So it's a really interesting lesson in, in understanding your customer and what do they need. Um, and, and then you also see in these charts like a really inconsistent use of energy. It doesn't necessarily make sense. It isn't always tied to um, crop cycles and whatnot. So, but this is something that Umeve is never really engaged in, but this is the bread and butter of decentralized companies. And if you can figure out what your customer needs, you can figure out how to give them the, the energy they want at a price they can afford that helps keep your business profitable. Um, I'm just aware of the time, and I want to make sure I leave uh, time for some questions and discussion. Um, so then we're doing two sites that um, altogether will electrify about 550 households. And in Africa, the average is about five people per household. So um, the goal here is to test the idea that by working together, we can achieve faster, better, more affordable access than by doing either solution alone. So in this case, we're doing a, a fairly traditional, in quotes, mini grid. Um, and uh, in, in the important part of sort of developing this side of the market, what we're seeing is that you can't have a mini grid without a sufficient load and households don't cut it. So what we have to do is start thinking almost about like a business center built around a mini grid. And there's a whole industry that's, that's now cropping up around appliance financing, right? Sounds familiar, 100 years ago in the United States, utilities actually sold white goods. That's one of the ways they drove demand here, right? So, so this is a, a very interesting lesson and opportunity to not only provide more services, but what's great about this is that in every pilot piece that we're doing, the utility has to be involved with the company itself. So they're learning as we go. So we have a series of working groups on, you know, how are we making policy? How are we getting the president excited? How, you know, how are we building political resiliency? Um, how are we operating together and whatnot, but on the technical side, um, it's really quite a breakthrough to have a risk-averse utility committing to working side-by-side -side with a mini-grid provider to figure out how we can create a load center for them that eventually will interconnect that that isn't a loss-leading customer, that is a valuable load to them, and in the meantime, we've grown businesses and opportunity and, and the lives of people. Um, the next uh, pilot we're doing is um, with what I think is really the future here in decentralized energy, which is um, scalable, flexible, adaptable power. Um, we're using a new system called the Infinity Grid, and essentially it's a, a series of rooftop systems that can be strung together and can help manage loads between households. But it ends up being almost like a mini grid, except it's not built in the ground in the same way that a traditional mini grid is. Um, that's provided, and I, I do want to give a shout out to our partners, that's provided by Zola, which formerly is known as Off Grid Electric. They're one of those companies that's got amazing venture capital. So the same company that invested in Tesla, DBL, invests in Zola. So that kind of opportunity, that kind of connectivity is starting to really speak about, again, how we can cross-pollinate between continents to improve any, everybody's energy. Um, some of our research questions, and, and I raise this up because I am going to have a call to action to people in the room here towards the end. I'm a campaigner. What can I do? I can't, I can't help myself. Um, but that, you know, we really do want to test if we can reduce the um, distribution and generation costs of new customer connections and also provide a higher reliability by using all these technologies in an integrated way.
Phase one is, is just in these four communities. The next phase is going to be more communities because obviously we need to prove we can replicate, but then it's also gonna be more technologies. So, um, you know, clean cookies been, has been an issue for a long time, but it's always been um, essentially like, you know, gas cooking that was meant to replace um, charcoal. But now we have solar e-cooking. Um, I think that's gonna be revolutionary in this sector. So bringing those online, bringing more appliances, which again, help drive demand, um, drive more benefits of energy. Um, and we are also gonna be involving EVs. And uh, you know, again, just to kind of shock everybody, Uganda has its own car company and it has a whole fleet of electric vehicles, right? And so <laughs> um, people, I think, don't necessarily think about um, developing countries as being advanced when it comes to energy. But in fact, there's a ton of innovation. It's a whole revolution going on there. And we heard a couple times yesterday mentioned leapfrogging. I'm not sure about leapfrogging, but what I will say is there's not the same institutional or even mental constraints that people have, right? Because it's kind of the undiscovered country. So there's lots of innovation, and for anybody here who cares about innovation, whether it was Greentown Labs yesterday or, or some of the others in the room today, I mean, it's, it's actually a really important thing that um, uh, that Next, uh, Grid Connects is doing by bringing the disruptors together with the traditional side of the energy industry because we actually all need it to move forward together. Um, so my call to action to all of you in the room, it is actually really important to embrace decentralized energy. And um, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound trite or contrived or anything, but it makes a difference when we within our own companies here in the United States or in our own households bring solar into our lives, you know, leverage the benefits of energy efficiency, but, but change the equation in terms of just thinking about energy as something that's a light that goes on and off instead of something we're actively engaged with. Um, piloting new business models. I was so inspired yesterday by the startup panel. I'm super excited about some of the things I, I heard. I mean, I live in California, so I was just there during our blackouts. Um, and um, it was interesting to hear about some of those technologies because they could absolutely be put to work right away um, in developing countries and help there as well. Um, this whole piece about working on win-win regulations, incredibly important. We don't have like a really good model yet for, for what integrated energy can look like from a policy perspective. And we're having to kind of do it piecemeal, working in the several countries we work in. We've got a footprint in about 10 countries right now. Um, but you know, a lot of the same companies go to adjacent countries to help build the energy markets there, whether they're mini grids or you know, uh, solar, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> or um, solar providers of another fashion. And, and every time you go to a new country, you have to figure things out all over again. So one of our visions for the future is having sort of a regional policy compact for decentralized energy and specifically for integrated energy so that we have a plan forward. In the same way in the United States, the energy efficiency market and the clean technology market grew up here with more regulatory certainty. It'll be the same in Africa, the same in India, same in Southeast Asia. Um, I think it's really important to have events like this, and um, here's the pitch to um, our Gridwise people, is grow this event and bring more disruptors and bring more international people because there's a lot that we can learn from each other. We have to develop a community of practice, capture the learnings, and work together. Otherwise, we're just gonna be spinning cycles and, and wasting energy that we don't actually have to waste. Um, and then finally, it's a pitch to partner with Power for All. Um, you know, we've been wanting for a long time to get U.S. utilities more involved in the work that we're doing from an advice perspective, from a corporate partnership perspective, um, and you know, perhaps that's something of the long term can be part of this conference. But again, it's just you know, the utilities in the U.S. are so well resourced. Um, you have so much flexibility, even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes. And if within your companies, those of you who are innovators, the more you can push on this front, the bigger difference it'll make. Um, but work with us as well, because whatever you're learning and, and whatever we can then bring and translate, you know, it actually ho helps the whole planet. Um, climate change is not a local issue, it's a global issue, and so caring about the grids and maybe avoiding path dependency in countries that haven't already built them out um, is a really important thing to do. It's, it's something you can be part of. So please look us up. 
you want to learn more about Utilities 2.0, um, powerforall.org slash utilities. Um, and we've got a whole raft of information there. In addition, um, we would love to have your participation in our fundraising. Um, you're welcome to donate. Um, and please tweet about us and get the word out there. Um, you guys are absolutely a vital part of the solution. And yeah, we want you hand in hand with us. So thank you.